I think you know, Fags has set that up really well, and I, you know, t- particularly myself, learn a lot off him in that space. Um, yeah, look, he's really um, supportive of, of the players, and you know, he could sit there after a game and find positives. Yeah, I think I remember one game played Adelaide, and Adelaide were you know, going pretty well at that point, seventeen eighteen, and he sat in front of the group, and we Adelaide beat us by. 50 points and comprehensively too good too mature at the time and but he still he said you know the last time you guys played them and 15 of you guys played against this mob last time um they kicked they beat us they beat you by 134 points so we've improved 80 points he could just find little so so if you're feeling if you're feeling like shit yeah you you could Make you feel not so bad, um, even though you got beat by fifty. But that's where that's how it was. That's where they were coming from. That's where we we're coming from at the time. So, but those those things you learn from, and you know, you can go home and kick the cat if you get beat by fifty points. But Fags had a really strong understanding of of where, you know, like where the club was heading in the direction that he wanted to take the club, and uh, and that sort of come out even in the coaching. You know, back at seventeen when we won five, we won ten games over. 17 and 18 so but you could you could see the seeds were getting sown back then that was this week's guest dale tapping one of the most respected afl assistant coaches going around and newly appointed forward line coach at the essendon footy club welcome to the one-on-one football podcast my name is harry simmington and alongside me in the virtual studio i've got former afl player the founder of one-on-one football and my former coach andrew rains how are you rainsy come on harry yeah it's um it's a uh summer and it's warm in Queensland and um, obviously the cricket's on so I've been tuning into the cricket and uh, and following the uh, the AFL pre-season update sounds like um, some grueling pre-seasons going on already so hopefully some of our footballers have, have sort of started back and, and, and back on that uh, the pre-season train. Yeah for sure it's that time of year and this episode will come out next week on uh, the 17th of December. Uh, some of our listeners will still be in their off-season. Um, others will be getting ready for pre-season. Um, so, so, mate, with Christmas just around the corner, how can footballers get their edge on, on their competition this summer? Oh, it's a great time. Obviously, with summer um, comes that opportunity to, as we discussed in our previous episode on pre-season, to be able to you know, sort of get that, um, get that edge on your, on your opposition or teammates and, and, and obviously no better to do than our one-on-one sessions and linking with our coaches there in your area um, to... To work on your game and whatever that may be, um, we've also got our summer masterclass programs um, running in on the Gold Coast, Adelaide, and Sydney. Um, I know definitely in Adelaide and Gold Coast, you can book in post Christmas um, and and sort of launch into the last sort of six weeks of that program. So for those who couldn't join the first ten weeks or commit to the first ten, and um, uh, you can now do the six, which is a really good number. I reckon a really sharp six week session leading into the to the season will be imperative for some of our footballers and and um i think um you know with the opportunity to to train in a small group environment still keeping our um our you know coach to to play ratio really small so you're not signing up for 50 uh 50 on one so you sort of one coach and 50 players it's it's really um, intimate and, and really designed to that individual um and and the small group um so check it check that out on our on our e-shop and also our gift vouchers a great idea for christmas uh, if you're Wondering what to buy um, or purchase um, over over the uh, Christmas period for your loved ones. Um, a great opportunity for our gift vouchers is also available on our shop. Yeah, for sure. And we'll, we'll add those links to the to the show notes as well, guys. So if you're listening to this and you're interested, just um, scroll down and you'll see all the links there. Uh, now, Rainsy, we've just finished recording our discussion with Dale. Um, he's a very intelligent man and, and one of the better communicators that I've come across in, um, in footy coaches or players. What can the listeners look forward to in uh, today's episode? It was a great interview with Taps. I think, um, and for me too, it was, it was a really good um, yeah, opportunity to sort of chat to, to Taps and, and like our other coaches, um, spend a bit more time and, and discussing uh, their background and, and what I found with, with Taps, just his, I suppose, his diversity in, in terms of um, being involved in the in the AFL and not, not just the AFL, um, just the whole pathway he took and from a player to, to, to a coach and there's some really good stuff in there and he talks about his journey 
um, along the way, and it's been a fair journey starting all the way back, probably from the sort of late 80s as a player and into the coaching realms of the AFL now in 2021, 2022. Um, talks about being the best she can be, and that's a big mantra for, for um, the talent space that he worked in with the expectation of players wanting to be drafted, um, just being the best she can be. Working with Chris Fagan and, and how their system helped change the culture at Brisbane. Um, his new role at Essendon, which is really exciting, what he can bring to Essendon, an up-and-coming club, and and um, and and on the rise, um, and what to expect in in his private coaching sessions. He's one of the most popular coaches up here in Queensland. Now moving to Melbourne, I'm sure he'll be um, sought after down there too. So, uh, without further ado, this is episode number 16 with Dale Tapping. You're listening to the One on One Football Podcast, the number one podcast for Aussie rules training, coaching, and development tips. Dale Tapping, thanks for taking the time to come and chat to us, mate, and uh, welcome to the podcast. No worries. Thanks, uh, Harry, Andrew. Hope you're well. Thanks for, uh, yeah, thanks for joining, mate. Um, obviously, it's been a, a really busy couple of months for you, relocating to Melbourne yep. um, from, from the Lions and moving into a coaching role from there to, to Essendon. Um, how are you settling in there, mate? Just a bit of an update. Yeah, look, been, uh, uh, t- this week will be completion of the fifth week because, obviously, the Bombers started... Um, a bit earlier than the other groups, um, the other teams. So, no, it's been good. It's been a really, um, really good start. And, um, you know, look at the, you know, sort of build new relationships, um, particularly with the staff and, um, and onto the onto the playing group. So sort of four or five weeks in, it's, um, no, it's been good. And it's, you know, it's great to get back home, um, you know, around our, um, you know, immediate family and, and friends, which is, you know, the, you know, the main reason for sort of, you know, heading, um, you know, heading back after five years at Brisbane. Yeah, for sure. And, and mate, we know you're, um, you're 23 years into your coaching career now, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But before we do, I'd like you to take us back to uh, your playing days. Um, so I believe you won a, a VFA premiership, which is the equivalent of today's VFL, um, a couple of amateur flags, and you actually spent the 1988 season on the, the senior list at the Demons. Um, mate, talk us through your journey as a player and, and how that all began. Um, I'll go back a bit now. Um, I've, I've actually got a a reunion on Saturday with the the, uh, the Paran boys, so that'll be good to catch up with them. So, um, yeah, started back in my senior career. Started back at Paran in the uh, in the VFA, um, which is now currently sort of part of the VFL. Um, and unfortunately, they don't exist anymore. They sort of um, you know, ran out of uh, you know sort of ran out of funds at at, a, at an important time, but. Um, yeah, it was a great time. Like, um, sort of went there through a mate. I was sort of playing a, a calling an under nineteens, and um, and you know, obviously transitioning lists and all that sort of stuff. Probably one of many kids that went through those programs, and not dissimilar to the tack these days um, to our C Cup and NAB League um, competitions. So yeah, and had a really good friend and who was playing at Brand at the time, and he said, "Look, um, would you be interested in come down and having?" Yeah, having a run. So obviously the football manager at the time, John Forster, rang me and um, yeah, sort of um, walked in and um, sort of right outside his office was a locker to the left and um, which I think had number 73 on it. So it was pretty quiet and um, didn't know anyone or not too many people That's anyway. It's a heavy um, number. <laughs> it was a heavy number. And uh, I, sat, I sat at that locker for good part of 10 years and even though I sort of progressed to number five and sort of you know I was vice captain of the club but I sort of sat at this locker for uh, 10 years that was it so so I just didn't change so um, but it was a great time and um, yeah really yeah I met some lifelong friends and um, had some great coaches and yeah footy was different back in the day then it was um, you know the VFA was um, a really strong competition obviously you know back ended the VFL um, back then, or the AFL as it is now, on a Sunday afternoon and um, a little bit of Saturday when they started um, televising their games. But um, the competition was really, it was a real senior competition. There was a lot of ex AFL players that, you know, once their you know, once their careers finished, at, at then VFL um, sort of rolled into um, the VFA, and um, so the, yeah, it was, a, it was a, quite a senior competition, and um, yeah, very. Very tough, um, very physical, um, and you sort of look back and you see some of the vision and you sort of wonder, you know, how you sort of, because certainly I wasn't that type of player, but certainly how, um, yeah, how, you know, I played over 100 games at that level and how you sort of survived some of it. So, um, particularly some of the finals are pretty hectic 
But I suppose when you're out there, you sort of just go about your business. But, yeah, 10 years there. Um, we won the flag, 87, and as a young fella then was lucky enough to get invite to Melbourne and made the list, um, which was um, great. And I had actually had an offer from the a Waffle Club, East Perth, in the middle of that year who were keen to get us across. But I was pretty keen to hang around with the Pram boys because I sort of had a feeling we'd, we'd either make the grand final or go close to winning it, which we did, which was fantastic. So I didn't want to miss out on that, having been there for sort of you know, four or five years. And, um, yeah, had the had a pre-season at Melbourne and... Um, yeah, sort of, I think, what do they call them, Ranger? They, they call them the Mars Series now, but I think they've played in a Panasonic Cup game or something against Fitzroy. There's been, um, or back there. been <laughs> a few no's over the year. It's a cup. Um, no, yeah, yeah. No, wizard. No, wizard, the whole lot, yeah. So, um, so yeah, it sort of had a yeah, it had, um, yeah, a game at that level, with, um, which was great. And, um, yeah, it sort of made their list, which was fantastic. But, you know, spent the majority of the year, or, yeah, spent the year in the... In the in the twos, but the other club made the grand final, so it was a pretty tough um, squad to break into back then. And I, I don't think they made a change to the team from about round fifteen onwards. Um, they sort of got on a roll, and everyone was fit and healthy, so it was really really difficult to um, to get in. And obviously, the spot that I was going to go for was probably more of a small defender type, and they were sort of stacked with a heap of heap of those guys at the time. I remember sort of Alan Johnson, Graham Yates. Um, yeah, Dean Sharon, those sort of guys you're sort of competing against. So probably uh, the pecking order, I was probably in the back of them. So in for that role. So I needed a, I needed a little bit of luck for me to sort of jump in front of them. So, um, but it was a great experience nonetheless. It was um, it was really good and and um, yeah, obviously uh, you yeah, know didn't didn't go on at that level and um, which is fair enough. You know, probably um, yeah, it's sort of my sort of one eighty. Um, the old five sort of ten and a bit, and you know at that at that level, um, yeah, I think I was a reasonable reasonable type of player, but um, so was everyone else. Um, you know, at that level, uh, that height and physical attribute, you sort of probably need to have a little bit more than um, you know than just the norm. And um, unfortunately, I probably just had the norm, so um, which was good enough to play at a good standard, but probably not quite good enough for AFL. But well, it was good to. Be around it and um, you know train and be amongst AFL players and um, you know, and the team made grand final that you're involved with for that year. So it was yeah, you know, still a really good experience. And and then the next year sort of went back to Paran and um, then sort of spent a couple of years getting injured. So um, sort of PCL and sort of broken scapula. And I think that's where the coaching stuff really started to take place because I was obviously still around the club, but then started to do a, a little bit of you know coaching as you'd call it back then but I remember Greg Hutchison our coach he said oh why don't you sort of help out a little bit with this and sort of had a bit of an interest in it and then sort of was helping him game day um can't really remember what my role was it was more just observing and you know what you're seeing but you start seeing the game from a little bit of a different lens um so probably maybe that's where the coaching sort of bug sort of started without even knowing it um sort of got myself physically right um, again and um, you know, kept playing through to um, you know, sort of 93, 94 and you know, played over 100 games in the club which was, you know, which was great, great footy club um, you know, we had a really good run of success there from about around 86 around about 90 was um, you know, really strong um, you know, some great personalities in the game back then at that level so it was um, yeah, it was, a, it was a good time looking back it, sort of the games changed a lot um, on and off the field so um, it was certainly it was different back then after the game. You know, it was sort of, you know, you sort of remember sort of standing in the shower for an hour after the game and having a few beers, but these days they're sitting in the ice bath for an hour, so it's a bit different. For the uh, but, Orong, Orong um, Hotel around the corner there, is it next to? Oh, uh, f- yes. A few yes, stopping Andrew, grounds. Um, spent many, <laughs> just spent many times. That was, that was just a drop punt from the Oval. So... Um, yeah, there was a very social, it was a great, you know, really good footy club, like, you know, had, had some success and, um, but also to, um, you know, like we, um, you know, like we certainly knew how to, um, you know, find a, find a good time, if that's what you want to say. So we, um, the boys were, the boys uh, weren't shy, sort of getting out and about and, but that's what it had, that's how footy was back then. You'd sort of, you'd go hard yeah, on the p- ground and, and after the game, you'd. Yeah, the, the boys had um, 
Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, in reflection, it was a, a. Yeah, it was great. Footy was great back then. It was. Um, yeah, it certainly changed a lot now, and obviously there's a lot more investment financially into it. But at the same time, yeah, you'd sort of you'd love to have a little bit of that. That sort of. Um, probably culture yeah. piece yeah, in the current game. If you could blend a little bit mm. of that in, I think it'd often, be nice. Um, um, I think yeah, I often think that too, mate. It's sort of an interesting one to, to, to listen to your, your background and your, and your playing history there and then go into sort of coaching. And I think sometimes they need a bit of a blend these days, especially the young young guys sort of coming through and can be a bit too serious. I'm not saying sort of loosen up yeah. too much, but um, I, think, I, think hats off, I think hats off to the current system with our professional is. But sometimes I think um, it is a bit too sort of serious. And if they brought a bit of that old school uh, philosophy back, I think um, you know, it sort of would help a lot with the mental state of some of the players. Um, yeah, it's it's mate, it's a, it's a great story, and obviously, um, I think I was probably in nappies, and Harry wasn't um, thought of uh, back in your time at uh, time at Melbourne. But um, it just shows the, the type of experience you've you've come through, and 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 obviously what you've done. Um, talk us through a bit more about sort of that contrast you sort of chatted to before, but but sort of now coaching, going into sort of coaching with um, with the amateurs, and then and then obviously then going to coach in the talent pathway with with sort of uh, with with Sandy. Sort of talk us. Talk us a bit through sort of um, you know the transition and the contrast of being sort of coaching both levels. Yeah, um, yeah. Started um, started coaching. I finished or well, finished playing, and then I I went and played at Old Zavs, Old Zavarians, which are an absolute powerhouse of the VAFA competition, and sort of played in. Fortunate enough to play under under a great mentor who you know, I sort of got too late and probably wish I had played under him. Yeah, a bit earlier, but um, you know the great Barry Richardson, ex Richmond stalwart, which reigns your dad would probably have a bit to do with, and just just a great, just a great you know human being and a, a really good man, and um, he coached us at Zab, so we we sort of won a couple of A grade flags, sort of ninety five, yeah, ninety five, six. So I forced enough to play in the first two, and I think they went on to win about seven in a row. Um, but he really kicked off that sort of era. Um, yeah, he was, you know, fantastic. And, and where I was sort of, you know, I was sort of, you know, I was sort of 28, 29, you know, pushing 30 at the time. And you, um, you know, you, you start to, um, you see things from a different lens and, you know, like he's playing management and even, a, you know, it was amateur footy, but it's still a healthy standard. And um, it was back then. It's even healthier now. I think the standard's brilliant. Um and yeah, he he was really good just looking after his players. Like he would, he would on Tuesday night. Like I sort of always enjoyed running around training, and he'd come up and basically kick you off the track at quarter past seven on a Tuesday. And um, and often I'd be okay physically, feeling all right, and I'd not argue, but I'd say, oh, I'm fine, I'm okay, mate. I'm happy to keep running around. I'm not going to get hurt in this drill. Um, he goes, no, get off. I want you off. And then I asked him. I said, oh. And then he turned around and said to us one day, he said, look, he goes, mate, I need you on Saturday at 2 o'clock. I don't need you at Tuesday night at 7.30. And I sort of never forgot it. And, um, you know, and just to how he managed his, you know, I was I think probably 29 at the time, but, yeah, you know, he's just looking after us. And, um, you know, you're working during the day. And I think back back then I was sort of in my landscaping days. And, um, you know, so he sort of took care of, you know, like so a bit of an insight into the coaching then and finished the jobs and, you um, then went on to the Amazon, sort of got a job at coaching Old Brighton in uh, B grade in '97, and and that was spent five years there, and we won it um, in our first year. They hadn't won one for about twenty years, and um, they'd been sort of perennial sort of finalists, and we were fortunate enough to um, get through um, grand final day against St Kevin's, and we. Um, yeah, in front of a great crowd. I remember the I remember the crowd was enormous for um, for amateur footy at Alstonwick Park, and uh, yeah, we won by about fifteen or sixteen points. So um, and yeah, so you know, it was a great start to your coaching career in terms of you know winning and winning a premiership in your first year. But in reflection, um, yeah, my coaching really didn't kick in. I don't think yeah you know, holistically until probably the following year when we lost half our squad. Went up to A grade, you know, one player got drafted, which was brilliant. Ten of our ten of our best twelve went overseas. And then you were really, you know, like trying to keep your group together and 
stay up in A grade, which unfortunately we didn't survive. Um, we got relegated. So really then, you, you know, if you're genuine about your coaching status and what you're doing, like that'll, that'll find you out because um, it was just the previous 12 months we were winning everything and, um, you know, obviously winning finals and grand finals and, the, um, the, you know, within 10 months you're, um, you're, you're down the bottom. So, um, you know, that's when it really sort of hits home in terms of, you know, you've got to start thinking about what you're doing in terms of coaching and philosophy and, um, you know, and how you go about your program. And so, yeah, I sort of stayed on at the club and um, we we sort of got ourselves back up to A grade again. We sort of... Um, you know, had another final series in B grade 99, 2000. We made the grand final, but got beat. Um, you know, we'll probably probably argue we we're favourite to win it, but we um, we got rolled by seven points. Um, and then 201, we went um, back up to A grade, but again, we got relegated again. So um, so it was a bit of a, yeah, you know, it was a really good time, but it was an up, up and down sort of start in terms of my five years at Brighton. And um, yeah, then I sort of just felt that um, myself and the club just needed um, and it was done really well. Like, um, you know, we both agreed that, you know, I'd probably, you know, if you go back to B grade again, like, I, I just think the club needs to, you know, just let someone else take the reins and, and um, have a crack and, you know, fresh voice. And um, so I ended up moving on to Old Scotch. Um, Old Scotch rang us. And I coached them for four years. Um you know, made the finals three to four, you know, a couple of preliminary finals, ironically got rolled. The three finals exits were against Old Zab, so um, Scots could never quite beat them um, as much as we tried, but um, yeah, we couldn't quite get across the line, so it was uh, interesting times. Um, and then I sort of, we had family come along and sort of our youngest daughter, Summer, was was being born and obviously living over in um, sort of, you know, spots with Newport there. I, I got involved with the Western Jets. Um, with Mark Neild and I took on like an assistant coach development role and um, and I absolutely loved it. It was just yeah, like it was um, you're getting basically no money for it at all. It was um, yeah, it was just petrol money you're doing it for and and I sort of was yeah you know, loving coaching as much as I'd ever done and with the kids and the kids was like they'd rock up for training. They're just trying to be as good as they can be every session. So I started to see the game and coaching differently. Um, where the VAF is all about, you know, win, win, win at all costs. Um, you know, a lot of traditional, very tribal, the, the, the amateur competition where, you know, the, the, um, the TAC Cup back then, NAB League, um, you know, sort of had a different philosophy around sort of, you know, getting the best out of players and obviously, you know, drafting players and, and, and getting the best out of the kids. So, um, so I did that for two years, then obviously got appointed coach at um, Sandringham in 09. Um, and you know, sort of uh, coached coached them for three years, and um, and we ended up winning a premiership in two thousand eleven. And I think we had about eight or nine the names, kids drafted. I think out of that team. So, um, uh, oh God, we had um, oh, Liam Sumner went to Remember GWS, yeah. um, top ten pick. Um, Liam is a yeah, is a, a you know, outstanding young player. He just had all the tricks and. Yeah, you know, very instinctive player. Um, yeah, you know, Jackson Payne who came with us to Collingwood. Yeah, played um, with Jacko. went on to yeah. Brisbane. I think he played about you to play with Jackson Payne. Very powerful. Right? Yeah, so yeah. Um, very funny young man. Uh, yeah, he just just um, yeah, probably a third it. third tall at AFL level. Yeah. Just probably yeah. didn't have that quite athleticism to get off from him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's you ended know, up playing thirty or forty AFL games and um, you know, good little career. Uh, Sam Frost, who's now currently at Hawthorne, Fletcher Roberts, who's a Premiership player at um, at the Dogs, um, he kicked four goals in the last quarter of uh, our grand final, and um, probably would definitely won us the game and got him drafted. I would have thought so. Um, he went on to um, yeah be a Premiership fullback for the Dogs in sixteen. Um, Alex Woodward, who um, unfortunately could have been anything, he just kept doing ACL after ACL, which is yeah. terrible. It was just tragic. But he was a wonderful young player. Um, who else did we have? We had um, oh, Ben Daru, who went on to be a rookie at uh, Richmond. Um, yeah, there was a number, a number of those kids there that were um, yeah, very, very good players. Yeah, for sure. And um, as you mentioned, that was a, a premiership year for Sandringham and, and you were the head coach. Um, so 
take us back to that period. In 2011, you're the coach of Sandy, you're a premiership coach of Sandy. And then in 2012, you're a development coach at Collingwood and you've been in the AFL system ever since. Without knowing the full story and, and looking at it from an external perspective, it seems like that 2011 season with Sandy was, was something of a, of a catalyst for your coaching career in the AFL. Is, is that how you reflect on it as well? Yeah, I think um, I think probably had a fair bit to do with the whole program. Like we started in '09, and like the the program at Sandy at the time was yeah you know, we it was a little bit loose in terms of you know our, our talent ID wasn't um, you know it wasn't as strong as it probably it could be. Um, yeah, you know, there was there were some things that we needed to do better as a whole program, and and it wasn't just about the draft. It was you know, sort of myself, you know, we had Wayne Oswald who had been there for a long, long time and he I had him Wayne in the first year in O nine and then he uh he stood down and then Ryan O'Connor come along, ex um Essendon and Sydney Swans rock, be the big uh, big rock. And he um yeah, he he was great. So we sort of had um we had a real philosophy around yeah, look, it was pretty obvious. It's all about the draft, um, but you know, there's going to be a large percentage, large percentage of your boys that come through your program, extremely, extremely disappointed um, because, you know, on average, I think back then it was about four percent of your of your squad of sixty that you have, or fifty out of sixty that were on your list. Particularly Sandy's program because you needed them with the breakdown of the school programming. Um, yeah, so our philosophy around that was it was all about the best you could be program. And and how that looked, and if it looked, if you know, if if it looked like being on AFL list, well, that was brilliant. That was fantastic, and yeah, you know, we we encourage that. But if it meant going back to your local community club and serving that club on field as a captain and on the committee later on in life, and if that's the best that you can do with your football career, well, that's we deemed that to be successful. Um, so a lot of the language, a lot of the discussion was around that. It wasn't just about the draft because a lot of the boys were going to be extremely disappointed um, if they weren't drafted. You're just going to hang, hang your, you know, your, your hat on the one hook, um, you know, which a lot of them got ambition to do. But you know, we just sort of coached around. Well, yeah, it's a, it was really about growth mindset and um, being the best you can be every single time you come to training. So we spoke a lot of the language and the coaching was around that and. And we sort of created a really good environment around, um, yeah, around around that sort of philosophy, and and it sort of, I think it sort of took a little bit of pressure off some of the kids too, because yeah, like internally, yeah, we we felt we managed things really well, and externally, well, there's things, there's some things you can control, but there's a hell of a lot you can't, um, and we just try to make the you know, our internal environment as really secure and as safe as we could for the kids because yeah they were, they were teenagers and you know their their first stop out of a nab league program or tac program is um senior responsibility whether that's on an afl list or playing senior footy at vfl or playing senior footy at your local club or your first year as an apprentice um yeah they're going into those they're going on those journeys um a lot of those kids post the um you know, their, their um, NAB career. So we sort of tried to set them up around that. So the philosophy was around the best you could be. And it was really a, a, around handing them over as just good kids, as good good people with, you know, the right behaviours and um, and things like that. Because if they went and went into the workforce and um, so it was things like, you know, if they couldn't make training, you know, they handle that conversation. So they they yeah they bring it ring up and speak to Rock or myself about they couldn't make training because you know they're held up at school or they're yeah. you know they're um, they're not they're not well but they make that conversation because they're got to handle those conversations is that is that instead you know, of the parents is that is that what you mean yeah we we really encourage yep. that yeah and there'd be exceptions obviously sometimes you know the parents have to you know depending on the circumstance but. But by and large, we try to encourage that, you know, that the boys handle those conversations because it's part of them developing in the young men. And, um, you know, if you're a first-year apprentice and um, you're going to be late for work, well, you, you pick up the phone and you, you ring your boss. Um, so there's no different. And so it was really just trying to link 
that messaging. And it, again, it was away from footy. Um, it was away from the draft. But yeah, you know, those things are important. And you're just trying to you're trying to set them up to succeed long term on and off the field. And um, and you're trying to hand them over as good young men for the next stage of their life because you know the you know if they, if, if the first year in the workforce, there's responsibilities that come with it. The first year in an AFL program, there's responsibilities that come with it. And um, yeah, and it's depending on what environment they go to, it um, can be pretty challenging. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a bit goes on. It's a good point there, mate. It just sort of on a bit of reflection there, and I love that sort of quote or comment you talk about being your best you can be. Sort of, um, you know, Harry's probably a good example of that coming through the academy up here, and I can't imagine kids being. It's probably a really good one for the kids to listen to, and also parents. But you know, being in a, a successful um, TAC or NAB League club like Sandringham and um, you know Oakley and, and places at least where they get up to sort of ten kids drafted a year, where on the academy you probably got you know, sort of one or two and, and three in a really good year. So the pressure would be on straight away from those sort of kids. And I know the pressure's on straight up here. And my messaging always a coach of those system, the talent pathway has always been, you know, sort of, you know, you've got a, a small percentage will go and make it. So how you can actually act in real life and how you're going to mature and actually transition into into life itself. And, and you're, a fo- you're, you're a person a lot longer than your footballer. And obviously Harry went through that sort of stage um, with his career too, obviously really wanted to be drafted and, he doesn't mind me saying he's sort of transitioned out really well and actually doesn't play footy anymore. So he's uh, he's transitioned fantastically. And again, it's 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 a dream. And if it doesn't come off, um, you know, sort of what what else and what's what's next in life? I think that sets players up. And not only as a as a coach, and probably what will lead to shortly with your coaching career in the AFL, but it actually sets you up to be a really good coach and mentor. I think for for a lot of people. Yeah, look, it's um, yeah, that, that's what we do. we just. Yeah, that, that was something that, you know, particularly myself and, and Rock got together around, um, you know, just working together on that and we're sort of really, you know, like united on that that sort of um, philosophy that, that become really important for us and, and it sort of, and that sort of infiltrated down to our other coaches, yeah, you know, who have gone on to be really successful coaches in their own right. You know, some of the assistants I had, you know, Paul Groves, um, you know, coached the AFL um AFLW, Western Bulldogs to Premiership, who's now Director of Sport and coaching St Bernard's in the um, A-grade competition down here. Um, you know, Shane Joyce, um, who coached collegians in, in the in the A-grade competition down here to two grand finals. Unfortunately, unfortunately for the big fella, got beat by five points and two points and two GFs. So, um, yeah, he could have gone down as one of the great legends of collegians. But, yeah, but... But he's still, yeah, yeah, like that's still a successful, yeah, for me that's still success. It'd be lovely to win, um, of course, but, um, but yeah, they've all gone on and done really, really well. Yeah, like Luke O'Brien, who was our ops manager, he's um, gone on to do different roles at St Kilda and, and now currently working in the AFL. So it wasn't just, yeah, it wasn't just myself. There was other, other members of our staff that have actually, at the time that have gone on and they've done really good things with their with their own lives and um and their own sporting careers so you know which is yeah which is good it's not just about yeah you know, it's not just about the players it's really it was about the whole program and um yeah which is um yeah you know, which is good and you know sort of you reflect on that which sort of you know we're pretty you know, we're still a really close group that sort of that 9 10 11 group particularly the coaches or we still get together and catch up yeah, you know, we have an annual catch up every year, and um, yeah, you know, we sort of got a WhatsApp group, and there's always something going on about one of us. And um, yeah, you know, it's not taken too seriously. You know, the yeah. boys sort of yeah, you know, like you get ahead of yourself. You'll certainly know it. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, look, that's what it does to you. You know, like you, you sort of you, know, you move on and you go on different journeys, but you, you generally sort of stay connected in some way, shape, or form with with those with those people that have sort of um, been pretty important to what what you've done you know so um yeah it was a good time it was a really it was a really good time no it's a good moment and moving on to Collingwood, obviously you get the gig there um you know straight after the the gig at uh, sandringham and it seems to sort of um most people you sort of talk to so got there in 2012 and and most people sort of connect with it with a mentor or someone that sort of really assists in the afl landscape is there anyone in sort of Collingwood at the time i think pretty important factor. I think Nathan Buckley just took over from Mick, was that right? Um, yeah, that's correct. And then, yeah, yeah fill us in a bit about your yeah. time sort of there and 
anyone you sort of um, you know still sort of in touch with today or, or strong mentors as yeah. you sort of transition to the AFL environment? Yeah, um, yeah, it was pretty. Rains, it was pretty. Um, it was, I was, it's a really interesting story. This um, I sort of had because Neil had just taken over from Melbourne and um, had taken over Melbourne at the time, and he offered me a role at a development role at Melbourne, which I didn't pursue. And I had a role, I had an offer from Essendon to run their development program and obviously uh, the Collingwood role. And I was probably an inch away from going the other way and taking the Essendon role. Um, and it just would have been interesting to talk about sliding doors because, I, I, unfortunately, if I had to take the Essendon role, I would have walked headfirst into um, the, the supplement saga um, and not knowing any different. So it's often, it's ironic I'm there at the moment. Um, and, but it, yeah, I was that, it was that close. Like it was, you know, they're both terrific opportunities, but it just would have been interesting if I had have turned right instead of left, um, you know, sort of where you'd be today. So I often have a bit of a think about that sometimes. So, um, but yeah, really fortunate enough to, to land at the pies and, um, you know, big club and, um, you know, Nathan's first year, um, he was great, like still stay in touch with Bucks and, um, you know, sort of caught up with him a bit of, in the hub last year to see how he's going. Um, yeah, but there was, you sort of look at the, the coaches when I first got there that was littered with BNF premierships, all Australians like, you know, Matty Lappin, Ben Hart, Rob Harvey, Craig McRae, current coach, Tarkin Lockyer, Anthony Rocker, um, no, oh, this goes on, you know. So, and I was sort of, you know, at the, at the bottom of the queue with them lads. But I mean, having said that, like I'm still, I've still got great relationships with all of them. Actually, like out of, you know, Tarka Lockie now heads up, um, you know, the talent ID of the AFL. Um, you know, I caught up, had a good chat, had a coffee with him the other day out at Essendon. So, we, you know, Pebs and I still still stay in touch, and yeah, you know, obviously all of them really like Craig McRae, Harvey. Uh, yeah, the whole the whole lot of sort of even Matty Lappin bumped into quite often a bit when I was up in up north. Um, so yeah, I've sort of kept pretty good relationships. Um, you know, with those guys, probably the probably the one guy that I you know we talk probably more in depth about the game and have got probably similar philosophies and um, yeah, and we have and we're we're pretty good mates around. You know, talking about footy and they were often ringing the the phone calls go for. You know, an hour, hour and a half. And there's um, Scotty Burns, who's now currently in Adelaide. Um, Burns, he got there um, about 14. But, yeah, him and I sort of um, worked really closely with him and I was coaching the VFL at the time and he was doing the mids. and So I spent a lot of time with him and he sort of you know, had a, you know, along with all the other coaches, but he had a particular impact um, you know, to teaching the game and, and certain aspects of um, midfield craft and things like that, and him, him and I, you know, sort of got a real strong relationship, particularly based around the game, and and often often talk and about a whole range of things that's going on in the game. So um, yeah, he's a, he's an excellent coach, and yeah, you know, he, he could be coaching AFL footy. I've got no doubt. It just probably sure. just needs an opportunity. So. Yeah, for sure. And and you alluded to the um, the role as the uh, head coach of the uh, of the reserves, which is sort of a, a role that we see. I guess quite commonly across the AFL, where you, you're, a, you're a development coach with the senior list and, and then a head coach of the reserve side, or, or you move between those roles during your time at the club. Um, you did this with the Pies for a few years, and, and obviously quite successfully in, in 2016, you ended up with the VFL Coach of the Year. Um, what is that sort of juggling act like, where you've got multiple roles, multiple squads, and, and different responsibilities, and, and how do you split uh, split your time between the two squads? Yeah, look, it's I would. I was actually talking to um, to Daniel Jean Syracuse the other day about this, and he coached the Doggies VFL, and we're both talking about our time coaching, and he was a couple years after me. And I'd say any young coach, any or any coach, but you know, particularly young coaches coming through the you know, the AFL programming, if you got the opportunity to do it and coach your own team um, within the AFL environment, um, a VFL job will stand you in really good stead um in terms of yeah from an particularly from an operational standpoint like there's you wear you wear quite a few hats um yeah it's it's going to test 
it's going to it's going to challenge and test your lines of communication, your organisation, um, and how you manage um, your players and your program. So you, you're really going to get, you know, in some ways a, a, a smaller snapshot of potentially what AFL coaching is about. Um, and obviously, AFL coaching is on a grander scale, but there's a lot, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that go on in the VFL program. And you know, I look at my experiences at Collingwood where we had, you know, obviously, you know, our AFL list, but we also had an, a VFL list that that we had of 22 players, I think. So obviously, you know, not every one of those 22 would fill the position, um, a position on game day. We might have, of that 22, might have, anywhere between 7 and 10 or 11, depending on your injuries and, and your management. Um, so you pretty much 50% on average would be used of that 22. So how you manage those boys back to their local football club. So you need to have, you need to have you know, a layer of communication and a relationship with the community coaches because you need to um, you know, talk to those boys um, and talk to those coaches around. Okay, well, you know, Rangey's not in their VFL team this week. He's going back and he's he's going to play at St Kevin's. And um, yeah, like and just okay. You know, Rangey's available for you this week. You know, we've been using him in this role. Um, yeah, look. So you, you've just got. Yeah, you know, you've just. I think. I think as long as you've got a line of communication, and um, you know, I think that helps all the parties. Um, so there's that. There's. You know, that component of it, it's it's linking, combining the VFL with the AFL listed boys who, you know, if they're not in the AFL 22, there's obviously going to be a layer of disappointment. But at the same time, you know, you've, you've, you know, you've got to sort of, you've got to link those two identities together, your VFL and your AFL list boys that are playing that week and, and go out and play a game of footy and um, and get the desired result. So, um, you yeah, know, there's all how you manage that and how you bring that together. Um, then, you yeah, obviously you've got your VFL program and how you run that. So there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that challenge you and there's a lot of things that it gives you opportunities to think about. And, like, we did some, we did some things like just little things like we would train our VFL program on a Wednesday, on a on an in season, we would try and recover Monday, so all our VFL list would be required to be at the club, regardless whether you played at your junior club, because um, it'd be a team review. So it was a bit of an education for those boys. Um, also, it was an opportunity to recover whether you played VFL or um, back at your local football club. So it was an opportunity to get your body going again and you know, get any treatment, see doctors, um, those sorts of things. So there was opportunity even though you weren't playing to get the best out of your body and the best out of your footy um, and there may not be a Wednesday night and generally I'd have a good idea around who was going to be available that week without 100% confirmation but I generally had a pretty good feel who would play um, and there'd be some guys I'd get to and say look you know, I'll let you know by tomorrow but at this at this, chance, at this point in time you're playing but I'll confirm with you tomorrow and it might be depending on what's happening above and things like that. But also, too, I think what that did, the guys that weren't playing, they could go back to their local club on a Thursday night and train with their local club and play with their local club on Saturday. I felt that was really important, that they could connect with, um, at least have a session with the team that they're going to play with on that weekend. Um, So we catered and tailored our program around that. That worked really, really well. Um, and we just, you know, like we just kept managing the conversations and, um, you know, in terms of selection and um, availability for local football clubs and, yeah. And every now and again, you get you get the eleventh hour call up, um, you know, like you know, interstate trips, uh, AFL clubs, AFL teams potentially take you know an extra player. So there's all those things, and um, and they those decisions sometimes aren't made to late, so it can have a ripple effect. Yeah, you, know, you can concertina down, down the order to... Calling up the local club and then they've got to pull someone out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, goes, been there uh, before with our set up in the academy. Happened yeah, all the time. Yeah, it goes... It goes um, but, yeah, the big, the biggest challenge we had at VFL level um, with our with our, with our our VFL list of boys was 
sustainability in terms of um, getting some continuity of players in your program, like keeping them around. So what were the things we could do to keep them around and um, you know, keep them playing the best footy we can? I remember when I took over in 13 as the, as the head coach, like our most experienced player had played 16 games of EFL footy. I think that was Jack Hallier who went on to captain the club for a record seven or eight years and played 120 by the end of it. Um, you know, which is phenomenal effort in the current climate of VFL footy to play 100, 100 games. I think it's amazing because of the way the demands of the competition. But but we, we did things like pre-season. We did, because we were working full-time in the AFL, but this is also for our staff, we would train Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, no Friday night training and give them the weekends off. But it wasn't, that was, was for the players that could spend time with their families, get away, um, yeah, a lot of them are tradesmen, and yeah, and just you know, it's like Friday afternoon, like just I've got to trudge off to footy training. Like you're not really going to get optimum performance. So yeah, we we just felt we tailored our program to a, a Monday Thursday football program, and Wednesday night was like a craft night. So that worked really well, and it, and it gave our staff, um, it gave our staff, and even ourselves as coaches who are working full time in the program that were in the development space um, a night off. And I reckon, I believe that worked really well. Um, the players loved it. Um, they got looked after. They got treated well. Um, and a lot of them stayed in the program for, you know, my five years at, at the club and four years coaching. And the vast majority of them sort of saw, saw that out. Um, yeah, and I think the programming and how we looked after them and took care of them, I reckon, really helped. So they're, they're just things that we did and that, that helped me with it. But they're the things you think about when you're in those roles. You, you know, you've got to think a little bit outside the square and um, and every environment's different, but you've got to try to crack the code what's going to work best for your environment. Cardinal sin, I reckon, mate, in, in footy, especially in talent pathways and, and mm-hmm. probably community footy, probably not the AFL, but Friday night sessions. Just a, I know in my time as yeah. a coach, I just... Uh, yeah, never wanted to, obviously the players sort of get the vibe, they sort of don't want to be there, the parents, um, if, they, if they're obviously junior players, it's a, it's, yeah. a, it's an issue one, so that's probably a good call there, mate. Um, obviously the, the background there just speaks absolute uh, level, a whole new level, obviously understanding your background and a plethora of experience there. Um, with, with that, obviously, I, I couldn't agree more in terms of, managing and coaching a program and a bit of a for the current system I think and sometimes and a bit of a knock on the system how it works with AFL coaches now especially with the big names that get the AFL senior coaching job they haven't really but they may have been a development coach they've gone straight into assistant coaching role and then a senior coach in AFL club and they've actually never done probably the you know the VFL coaching role or even a talent pathways role of, of that sort of you got your hat on and, and multiple hats on at a time managing I think that gives you a huge grounding and apprenticeship in mm-hmm. in football so for our listeners out there that's 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 critical I think um, to, to add to you to, to your coaching CV um, and now in the current landscape mate how it obviously looks and, and I'm seeing more of it that you don't necessarily need to be a big name or, or obviously play that senior game or, or multiple senior games um, 100 games 200 games in the AFL to to get an AFL coaching career, but I speak to a lot of community coaches and and that these days and looking to aspire to actually just probably on your quote before about just getting the best out of themselves as coaches and if that's an AFL gig somewhere, if it's a development coach, talent pathway gig, so be it. Um, do you believe there's appropriate pathways and courses and avenues for coaches in those positions these days, mate? Oh, absolutely. Like, I think for me coming through, like I, I tended a lot of things I always was open to learning I had a real like um, I had a real strong attitude to learn and um, and and just take every opportunity um, that I could like go and you know look even back then I remember going to level two and you know sort of driving out to Monash um, you know on a Sunday for a level two coaching course way back Um, yeah so just doing all those you know, they're, they're, they're from a learning point of view and there's always really good presenters at those things. Um, and you meet some people at, you know, you'll, you'll meet some opposing coaches and you'll you'll strike up a conversation over a coffee and and often, you know, sort of, you know, touch base. You know, so there's there are opportunities. So the coaches out there, I'd certainly, um, I would certainly um, encourage you to sort of 
to be open to learning new things um, and take the time to invest um, in yourself because it's, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of you know, on the run PD for yourself. Um, certainly get a mentor because um, I think you, you need to, you need people to, you need a mentor and really like the mentor, you know, he's there to give you guidance and, and, and support. So really think long and hard at, about who you want to, um, you, know, you don't have to go and get your best mate, um, but someone that knows you pretty well um, might be someone with a little bit more experience, um, a little bit older, who's you know got a little bit of wisdom and, and seen seen you know both sides of the highway in terms of life's journey. Um, that can be really honest with you in terms of um, you know your coaching and and you know he can observe you on the track, he can observe you game day, he can observe you at the breaks. Um, you can observe you in a meeting. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're just um, they're just things that you, you pick up and they're things that I've sort of picked up. Things like how, you know, to the point now where, you know, your meetings, how you construct your meetings, and it might be as simple as, as how you set the room up will create the environment for what you want to get out of your meeting, um, where you stand in the meeting, how you, how you make eye contact with, the players in the meeting, how engaged you get in your meeting with your players. Um, yeah, you're not just telling, you, you know, you're inviting them into the conversation. You want to hear from them. So they're all things that you learn, but you, you need some, some some mentoring around that to get appropriate feedback. I think, you know, it certainly encourages the coaches out there to, um, you know, to, to challenge themselves in that regard. Um, yeah, and it, it at times it could be a little bit uncomfortable because um, you're hearing um, you're hearing different things. But I think to get the best out of yourself, sometimes you need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, you know, just so you, you can find another level. Um, you know, find okay, well, that worked. Um, yeah, that worked well. That was really good. Um, yeah, and then maybe next time, um, you know, look at that. Um, yeah, so they're just little little things that you can um, learn. Um, and I think the other thing, just be patient. Um, I think you've got to have a level of patience. I've seen a lot of coaches that are in a rush. Um, a lot of the coaching, you know, the coaching, the coaching game is not a store gift. It's not over in ten seconds. Um, yeah, you know, just be patient. And I think, yeah, you know, look, yeah, you know, I've sort of been doing it now for a number of years through a whole, yeah, you know, range of, um, you know, pathways and different competitions. So you become sort of pretty rounded. And that's along with your working life prior to getting into full-time footy. This is my 11th year now, full-time. Um, so you sort of keep gathering a lot of experiences. And just and I would just encourage people out there and coaches out there, just be good at what you're doing. What you're doing. Yeah, if you're currently a development coach, you'll be really good at that. And the opportunities will open up for you. Um, um, you know, if you're assistant coach coaching the back line, well, be really good at that. And um, yeah, be a team player, be all those things which you need to be. That's that's nothing new. Um, yeah, but be good at what you're currently doing. Um, and the rest, the, the rest of um, yeah, the other the other opportunities will open open up for you. If you're doing a good job, they'll um, yeah, they'll, they'll they'll find you. Um, so yeah, there 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 are a number of things that I'd recommend that yeah, coaches. Yeah, you know, can can do, and you and you and just be open to learning. Just have that attitude online philosophy around. I think if your attitudes, you know, open to learning, well, you're going to take more information in. You're going to explore um, different things. Like I reflect on when I started to some of the things I do now, and it's just forever evolving. I, I think I've always had a strong um, connection with players and been able to communicate calmly and sensibly with them. Um, that's not saying you don't have your moments of frustration, but um, you, know, you, you just learn different ways now of um, you know, how you run your meetings, how you set things up, how you set your game up, you know, how you coach, how you interact. Um, you just keep evolving. Um, and I think you just got to keep being open to, to new things because the game, you know, you'll never catch the game. I don't, you know, I've sort of always, you never, ever, if you think you've got it licked, well, it'll it'll kick six on you in five seconds. So, um, yeah, I think just be, you keep respecting the game and, um, yeah, and just keep it and, and just enjoy it. Um, yeah, because obviously, you know, you can get really passionate and get involved in it. Um, yeah, this thing's 
that I do that I'm I've got a couple of things that I do really strongly that I'm committed to. Um, yeah, things like after a game, I don't code immediately after a game. I go home and spend some time with my family, and, um, and obviously being in Brisbane, like you, you're on the run with the travel a fair bit. So pulling out a computer when you get home after being away and um, and you haven't seen your family for two days is probably not the best thing to do if you respect your family greatly um, and love your family. So just things like I've become really accustomed to just putting it aside, taking emotion out of it, pick it up the next day, I'm fine, I'm coding more efficiently, you know, I've calmed down or, you know, like, um, you know, you, you just see things for what they really are um, and it's never as good as it seems, it's never as bad as it seems, it generally sits somewhere in the middle like most things in our life. So, um, so it's just sort of having that sort of calm, you know, sort of approach to... Yeah, some people are different. Some people, you know, some guys, you know, need to go and code straight away and get it get it off their chest. But, um, you know, I'd sort of prefer to do it a little bit differently. Um, and I think that works best for me. So I think you've got to, you've got to have an understanding of yourself, a self-awareness of, you know, what works well for you. Yeah, for sure. And I, I want to touch a little bit on that, um, on your sort of personal approach to, to coaching and some of your learning habits as well a little bit later in, in the bonus episode. But um if we moved on to Brisbane now, so in 2017, you moved to Brisbane um, where you took on the role of midfield and, and stoppage coach. Um, and that was sort of the start of the, the Chris Fagan era. Um, yeah. Now, we all know the, sort of the story with Brisbane. There was, there was a big maybe culture change or culture shift. Externally, it looks like there was and the results um, obviously reflected that. What do you think made your system at the time so effective? Um, was, it, was it the people? Was it the techniques? Um, and how did it all happen so quickly? Um, oh, I think, yeah, the Fags has got to take, um, you know, a, a lot of credit for it. Um, you know, he just sort of come in and Fags is all about, um, you know, like a very good man manager, um, growth mindset, continual improvement. And that's what it was. Like even in 17, like I remember we had, we had a simple, simple, um, philosophy around a bit of our team defense was, it was, um, and when, when did you finish, Rainsy? Uh, end of 2014. Yeah, so I have no, just missed you, you know, by, you know, a couple of years. But, um, you know, in 2016, I think Leopards last year, like Brisbane were, had an average losing, uh, or points against, points against was, uh, we were, we were averaging 120 points against. So defensively, we were really, you know, really poor. So one of our KPIs was just three to two. And what that meant was just bringing that triple figure number down to two to getting our points under 100. So it was, so that was continued. So we just chipped away at that. Like it wasn't going to be built in one year. It was just chip, chip, chip away at that. So, yeah, we become, we, we started to own our defensive game a lot more, um, evolved our defensive structures. And there was improvement there. By the end of the year, I think we got it down to, you know, we saved about four goals. This is in 17 when we only won five games. But you could see we were on the right track. And then next year we got it down to, you know, 90. And then now I think it, I think last year was down to about 77. Um, you know, so that's sort of just grown um, over the last sort of five years. But that's just one example of continual improvement and a bit of marginal game stuff that we're really focused on. But it was all about, um, you know, obviously drafting young talent because they finished down the bottom, so they they bring in, you know, McCluggage, Berry, you know, Bailey comes the year after, um, you know, really high picks and great talent and have really now become very, very good AFL players. So, yeah, talent helps you. Um, yeah, there was, there was some young talent there anyway in terms of key defence, in terms of Andrews and Gardner. Um, you know, so, you know, Rich, Rich has probably got, you know, you could, you could say he's got better with age, um, you know, probably a lot more professional about how he goes about it now than what he was five, six years ago. Um, you know, Zorko has continued to be a great player um, and a really good leader, underestimated leader. Um, probably the, say the best thing that's happened to him was given given the role um, as leader because it really really brought the best out of him and really matured him as a as a person. Um, yeah, and just the coaching. I think the coaching staff. Um, you know, we were um, well, still are really. Um, yeah, you know, obviously, I've I've moved back to Melbourne now, but you know, the coaching relatively in terms of profile was um, 
you know, there's not many high profile names there at all. We've really, um, you know, sort of, it was just Fags and, and, and us and, you know, people like myself who come from, you know, sort of lower profile backgrounds and um, a couple of development coaches from country, Victoria, Tasmania, that no one really heard about, but, um, you know, end up sort of putting a work really well together, really collaborative group, um, you know, sort of did some really good stuff around the culture piece um, and really well managed by Fags and we just chipped and chipped and chipped away and just each year just tried to get get better with how we play like the games the game the game Brisbane play is not over complicated game so um, you know can can you can continually evolve it and get better with it um, yeah and I think you know, obviously brought in you know brought in some uh, you know traded in some really good talent you know Cameron and Banahu and these guys so that's just been uh, it's all gone into the mix but I mean I, I think overarching it's just been the growth mindset and the continual improvement attitude of Fags and, and the coaches and, and the footy club I think that's fundamentally the focus and you know you know talent's always going to come in and out of your door um yeah but I think that's the way it's managed and um I think you know Fags has set that up really well and I you know particularly myself, learn a lot off him in that space. Um, yeah, you know, look, he's really um, supportive of, of the players and, yeah, you know, and even some of the, in the early 17, 18, when we, yeah, you know, we got beaten and, you know, he could sit there after a game and find positives. Yeah, you know, I think I remember one game, played Adelaide and Adelaide were, you know, going pretty well at that point, 17, 18, and he sat in front of the group and, we Adelaide beat us by 50 points and comprehensively too good too mature at the time and but he still he said you know the last time you guys played them and 15 of you guys played against this mob last time um, they kicked they beat us they beat you by 134 points so we've improved 80 points he could just find little so so if you're feeling if you're feeling like shit yeah you, know, you, you could make you feel not so bad, um, even though you got beat by 50. But that's where that's how it was. That's where they were coming from. That's where we were coming from at the time. So, but those those things you learn from and, you know, you can go home and kick the cat if you get beat by 50 points. But Fags had a really strong understanding of of where, you know, like where the club was heading in the direction that he wanted to take the club. And, uh, and that sort of come out even in the coaching, you know, back at 17 when we won five, we won 10 games over... 17 and 18 so but you could you could see the seeds were getting sown back then and i reflect and you know look back now and go okay well i remember you know i remember that in 18 i reckon that i mean it was a game in it was a game played port adelaide over port adelaide and we lost beams before the game he pulled out and we went um went over there at adelaide oval and and this is the time I really thought, yeah, okay, we're 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 going all right here, and we're on the right track. And we played them over there, and we should have won. And we come from about five goals down, and we just we just fell short by about three points. I remember Alan Christensen had a shot for goal, snap over his shoulder, and just fell short, and it touched on the line. But um, but like it was like we lost the game, but one long term. Like, and it was like a real, just like, a, it was a real turning point, like, for Brisbane at the time. I thought, yeah, I reckon we're right now. You know, like, and then we, because we, you know, they were, I remember talking to Tommy Rocklick after the game. He goes, you should have won. <laughs> yeah, he goes, you know, he, was, he was a port at the time. He goes, you got, you had us. Yeah, so I think they know they're lucky. You know, like, so it was just a real turning point. I think that was a combination of all that. You know, all that learning over that 17, 18 period of, um, you know, just keep chipping away, keep, keep, um, you know, just have that continual improvement, growth mindset, you know, it will, it'll, will be rewarded at some point. So, um, and then it just started to turn and then 19, 19, I think, I think 19, 20, 21, Brisbane on percentage, which I think was about 76%. That won the most games of AFL footy in that three-year period. So, um, so now, you know, they're, you know, they're they're probably as good a chance as anyone in twenty-two to, to probably go close to winning it potentially. So, but I mean, it was a lot of lot of hard work, and um, but yeah, it was a it was a great time. We 
We loved it and it was, yeah, certainly from my own coaching, it was um, a wonderful experience to be part of, um, you know, particularly the, the three final series the last few years and, um, you know, full house at the Gabba um, was, yeah, pretty exciting stuff to be part of um, and I'd, I'd say it'd be even better if you were playing. So, um, so yeah, so it was a great experience. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it, it really seems like your, your time at Brisbane was similar to your time at Sandringham. You sort of... Um, come in, help, help change the culture, help improve the program and then, and then leave the program in a, in a better place, um, obviously with the help of, of the team around you. But um, fast forward to the present day and you're, and, you're, and you're at Essendon, you've only been here for a couple of months now, but um, could you just talk us through your new role um, and, and how it's going to differ as a, as a forwards coach now from um, what your midfield role was with Brisbane? Yeah, it's, um, it is certainly certainly different when sort of when when Ben Rutten and Josh Marnie sort of spoke to me at uh, the end of the year. And it's sort of, it's certainly different and um, it's a different role than, than what I've done, but there's, um, and just the opportunity to do the forwards, to do the forwards role, but also do, also I'm sort of working a lot on um, our contest attack ball movement, um, you know, our contest in our front half. So I'm sort of, there's elements of, um, yeah, you know, the previous experience of Brisbane that I can bring to the table. Um, yeah, you know, working pretty closely with Blake Carousella in terms of um, you know, yeah, you know, sort of how the ground looks and you know, how we move the ball and things like that. So that's been a really good experience um, thus far. Like learning from him, he's very, very clever in terms of um, how he sees the game and and yeah, you know, what you do with the footy offensively. So that's that's been um, that's been really good. So yeah, and primarily yeah, you know, like. Um, looking after the looking after the front half of the ground, so yeah, there's yeah they've got a really um, I think a really strong group of coaches, but there's not as many coaches as um, as Brisbane. Like there's just there's Gia, um, Blake Carousella, um, myself, and obviously you know, obviously Ben is a senior coach, and Lee Tudor in development, and Cam Roberts in, in development, and yeah, I've got a little bit of IT support in terms of a um, bit of stoppage stuff. So, um, but it works really well. There's a lot of collaboration in terms of um you know training and how everything gets set up um so yeah it's it's been to this point it's been as i said it's uh, i think tomorrow will be the end of my fifth week um but yeah to this point really enjoyed it they've been um extremely professional um in terms of uh, touched on before around culturally how they you know they want all their people to to understand um you know a lot about the history of the club, and and you know they're a big club. But when you you sort of sit in the induction last week, and you go, "Geez, yeah, you know, like okay, I get it now." It was really quite personal how they sort of brought you on that journey. So, um, yeah, and the facilities are, um, you know, they don't want for anything. The facilities are amazing. So, um, yeah, it's sort of, um, yeah, it's something I'm sort of really looking forward to. It's, um, it's a little bit different to what I've done previously, but again, it's another opportunity for me to to. Um, you know, to improve and yeah, you know, and and get better. Um, you know, sort of, you know, sort of um, challenged. Uh, you know, going to be sort of challenged a little bit in a different role. Um, but that's a good thing too. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll learn a little bit about a bit about myself, and um, and and I'm sure I'll um, I'll learn a lot. So, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, it's awesome, mate, and looking forward to hopefully seeing a couple more of uh, those presentations. This time, probably some forward line craft, mate, which is which is great. Now, moving on to the one-on-one platform, mate. You've been on on board for a couple of years now, and um, obviously reached out a while ago. And and um, yeah, we've we've loved the time um, you've been on on board now. Um, one of the most sort of popular coaches in in Brisbane, and no doubt in in Melbourne that'll that'll be the case too. Um, what do you mostly enjoy about coaching the one on one environment and, and the younger players, and what can players expect when they book a session with you? Oh, look, what do I enjoy? It's just it's that sort of that one on one sort of tutelage and, and learning, and um, and yeah, a lot of the a lot of the um, a lot of the boys and girls that, that sort of come on and and you do a session like they're all. They're all got different attributes, and they all want to learn something different. So I think it's um, yeah, it's just it's it's managing, it's it's managing um, you know what they want to learn and um, and teaching them um, what they want to learn. But I think um, yeah, what what they can expect from me is you know, a really well prepared session. Um, you know, understanding them, you know, sort of you know what they want to learn. Because that'll help prepare for the session. Like it's not just come along and just have a kick. It's it's you know, is there anything particularly you want to work on? Whether it's your ground ball craft or your kicking, 
or you know, your body work or running patterns, those sort of things. I think sort of having an understanding of that prior to the session can help plan or it does help plan the session. So you, you know, you can go into your session, okay, well, I've got an hour or so to work and, um, you know, this is, this is what we can do in the hour. Um, and then, and revisit it too. Like, uh, yeah, it's not everything's going to get done in that one session. Um, and the growth mightn't come to the third or fourth, fifth session. So, um, but a lot of the guys have, and girls that I've worked with, um, there's been some real, some real improvement. Um, particularly, yeah, particularly the people I work with in Brisbane when I first started doing it. So, um, yeah, and it was just, and sort of how it started was just really when COVID struck. So I thought I'd better, um, look to, um, do something and it um, sort of been with the program ever since. It's sort of been really good, actually. It's um, it's uh, yeah, it's really really well organised and easy platform to use and um, and very professional. So um, yeah, so book a session. Yeah, for sure. And um, if you are a, a footballer out there and you're based in Melbourne and you'd like to connect with Dale, um, you, you can do so on the uh, on the one on one football website. Just go to one on one football dot com dot au and. Um, you can search the Victorian-based coaches, and um, we also have virtual coaching as well. So if you're not in Melbourne, you can uh, connect with Dale uh, from afar by booking a, a virtual coaching session. Um, and that obviously goes for, for coaches as well with with, um, with with coach mentoring. So a great uh, resource there, um, Dale, for for Melbourne footballers. Obviously, the Brisbane footballers are probably a little bit disappointed that you've that you've left, but uh, I hear you've passed them on to uh, to Zane, a couple of the uh, couple of your footballers. Yeah, I've, yeah. There's a, there's a couple of there's two or three of like. Yeah, young Finn Raymond, who's really, he's really passionate. He's, he's really improved. He, he's sort of entering senior footy next year, I think, at Morningside. And I spoke to Clint Watts a few weeks back, and he said he's going really well. So he's a really good kid, actually. Um, so yeah, I, did a, I did a little um, little virtual session with him a couple of weeks ago. He just sort of rang up. and So I've sort of stayed in touch with a... Yeah, with a, with a couple of the ones, I've, particularly the ones I've worked with really regularly over the last sort of 18 months. So... Um, yeah, and I just, you know, sort of, I'm happy to, you know, take a message from them, see how they're going and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, but no, it's good to, yeah, it's like Zane does a, he does a really good job and um, and obviously Clint does a good job too. So they're probably the two that I've sort of um, handed, you know, some of those um, boys and girls off to. So they're in, they're in safe hands. Beautiful. It's uh, what we like to hear in that um, that holistic approach as well, being more than just a coach, is, uh, being a mentor as well. That's sort of what the program's all about. Yeah. Um, Dale, mate, that takes us to about the end of the episode. We could uh, we could talk all day, but um, we're gonna have to cut it at some point. So, mate, thanks so much for um, for for taking the time. And I know, as always, I, I seem to learn learn heaps every time we do these interviews. So, um, hopefully, the listeners have, have had that too. And um, yeah, we're really appreciative appreciative of your time. Pleasure, mate. No worries. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Ramsey. Thanks, Taps. Cheers, mate. Thanks for listening to the One on One Football Podcast. If you got something out of today's episode, we'd love it if you could leave us a review on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to stay updated on special guests, new episodes, and more, please subscribe to the show on your chosen platform. And finally, if you have any questions for Rainsy or myself, or you want to get a particular guest on the show, please reach out. Our email address is podcast at one-on-onefootball.com.au. Thanks, guys. We'll see you for the next episode.